Hello booktube, how are you doing? Uh, I myself have been feeling rather prickly for the past couple of days. For one reason or another. But today I'm feeling rather good. So I thought I'd make a video about some of the books I read in 2020. And this won't be the best of 2020, nor the worst of 2020. But I thought I'd uh, share some books that left the biggest impression on me or gave me something valuable or, you know, just the books that left a mark on me, so to say. Yeah, let's get right to business. Let's start with this one. Ursula K. Le Guin's Tales of the Earthsea. <laughs> or the, the books of the Earthsea. So, um... First of all, I like to say I want to say that I did not uh, like the entire collection. Like I think they get um, after the fourth book or so, they get gradually worse in my opinion. But um, the good stuff is really good in my opinion. But the big thing about this is that it made me realize just how big uh, Le Guin's influence uh, over today's fantasy and sci-fi authors really is. Like, read something like N.K. Jemisin's The Broken Earth trilogy. I, I'm not sure if there is a connection, but I heavily felt Le Guin's influence in these books. So the valuable thing about this is it just how it made me realize just how important a writer Le Guin was for today's sci-fi and fantasy authors. Right, next one, some non-fiction. Behave, the biology of humans at our best and worst by Robert M. Sapolsky. And this reminded me what I really like about nonfiction, or what what is good nonfiction to me. Like this, not only is this very informative and sort of knowledge expanding work but also it is very readable and even entertaining at times so Sapolsky really comes across as a very humane humorous person and that's a great thing in my opinion that the author's personality shows through the through all the information that's in, that's in this book. That's what I really like about good nonfiction. And it reminded me of the Ancestor's Tale by by Richard Dawkins. Also the structure. You know, moving from small scale to larger scale, or from from from, from you know little details to bigger details, <laughs> bigger picture, or something like that. But the uh, but the way the author writes is very much the same sort of. Very, very casual, like the author is not just giving you information, but sort of trying to establish, you know, a connection. Like, he is not a person on a high pedestal, but he is really trying to, you know, speak to a, speak to a person just like anyone else. Well, that's the way I think, at least. So, yeah. Behave by Robert Sapolsky. 
really good non-fiction. Next one. Salman Rushdie, Keskiyön lapset, translated by Arto Häilä. So obviously this is Midnight Children. Midnight's Children in English. And I read two books by Rushdie in 2020. I read his debut. It's called Grimus or Grimus. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it. But I thought it was just mediocre. Like he was trying too hard without the ability to do that. Oh, yeah. You get what I mean. And But with this one, I think he really managed to pull, you know, he pull all the strings together, like harness all his capabilities. This is a very multi-layered book. So it's very good for multiple rereads, I think. And Rushdie does an excellent job sort of mixing um, sort of the contemporary history of India with uh, allegory and uh, Indian sort of heritage and works like Arabian Nights. Elements from that really come across in this book. And what I really liked about this is that it does uh, magic realism very well, in my opinion. And there's one thing I would like to say about the narrator. You can agree or disagree with me in the comments if you've read this book, but I think you can sort of read the narrator in two different ways. Either you believe everything he says, or uh, you about approach him as an unre unreliable narrator with a bit of skepticism and you know take everything he says with a pinch of salt. And this results in that you either um, approach you know the magic, so to say, literally, meaning that you believe that there is telepathy or weird connection with the midnight children and so on, or you think the narrator is just you know a storyteller, adding a bit of imagination to the mix to make the make his stories more entertaining. I think that's that's what's going on in here. Like don't take don't take the word uh, the words literally. And I would also like to say what I mean by magical realism. Like to me magical realism is not magic tricks or fairies or whatever weird <laughs> weird fantasy crap in in real world. To me, magical realism is all about making reality seem more magical. Whether it be done by, you know, metaphors or language in general. But yeah, it's all about making reality magical. And this really excels in that. Would highly recommend it. Next one. Another big tome. Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. It was translated by Lea Pyke. <laughs> so yeah, I put post-it notes on each translated book so I would remember the translator. So I've translated like two books and you no know, the sort of credit the translator is really important in my opinion. Um like 
I pretty much knew what I was getting from this book before I started. Like, I wasn't I wasn't unfamiliar with the uh, tragic fate of our main character. But still, I was rather surprised by this book. Like, I knew how this was going to end, but the end, no, but the ending still managed to surprise me, in a way. I won't go into much detail here, because that would mean, mean spoiling the book. For I know there are some sensitive people out there. I myself don't care at all if someone spoils the book, because... <laughs> If you can spoil the book, then the book wasn't <laughs> any good to begin with, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, this is you know a strange mixture of Gustave Flaubert's uh, Madame Bovary, the bloat of Charles Dickens and Goethe's you know uh, young Werther or whatever. You no, know, that very very sad depressing and uh, romantic tempestuous main characters and so on but um uh, tolstoy really managed to sort of weave several big important uh, themes and topics within the main narratives so there's lots of talk about uh, city life versus country life, um, bureaucracy, uh, and, you know, city jobs versus agriculture and so on, and aristocracy versus uh, farmers, and mm, sort of nationalism, people, civilization, and yeah, lots of big topics and things in here. As well as the, you know, big love stories. I would also like to say that I think the title is bad. It shouldn't be Anna Karenina. Because the title here, like, it does the mis does a misservice to the book, like, as you sort of them, it sort of guides the reader to focus on that one character, whereas in in reality there are you know several couples that you want to follow, and how um, those couples prosper or destroy themselves. That's how I would summarize the, this book. So yeah. I knew what I was going to get, but I was still surprised by this book. All right, next one. Yashar Kemal, a Turkish writer. And this is Haukani Mehmet, or Mehmet my hawk in English. Um, translated by Eva Sikarla. And last year, in 2020, I read several books by Yashar Kemal for some reason, and I really, really liked this book. Some books were just okay, and I pretty much hated one book, which is rare, because I don't really hate books, because I think there's something to value in each book. But that was just crap. Uh, oh yeah, can we appreciate this cover a bit? Uh, I think this is excellent design. Um, so yeah, here Yashar Kemal sort of creates big narrative around one boy who grows up to become sort of a young man. No, oh, it's a Bildungs Roman in some some way uh, about this boy's struggle, you know, growing up in poor, harsh conditions to become, you know, celebrated hero or the liberator of his people. So there's really engaging story in here. 
but also I think Kemal really uh, shows the power of false information, false truths, and you know, Americans out there, what false truths can do to people and misinformation. So yeah, there are rumors spreading fast and widely, and gossip all around, and um, they do, you know, two kinds of things. They can sort of belittle our hero, make him, you know, suffer even more, or they can sort of lift him up and sort of <laughs> create bigger stories and legends around him. So yeah, I think Kemal um, is not a good writer, like not a good fiction writer, <laughs> unless, uh, except this book, but I think his description of nature and landscape and habits and, you know, uh, struggle and all those kind of political things uh, they made me feel that he, this is one of those writers that would have written a lot of good non-fiction anyway Yashar Kemal Mehmet My Hawk I would recommend this one right next one Patrick O'Brien, Kuninkan Mies, or Master and Commander, translated by Renne Nikubaavola. And, yeah, I have not, not read the entire series yet. I read the first two books in Finnish. And I was so impressed that I, you know, bought the entire series in English. And... What I like about this is that O'Brien really uh, develops a nice relationship, a friendship between Aubrey and Maturin, and that is really the driving force with these books. And but what I really like about these books also is that they appreciate the reader's intelligence, so to say, that they don't underestimate the reader. Like, my issue with modern oh, know, contemporary fiction, mostly in, uh, mostly fiction in, written in English, is that they really <laughs> underestimate the reader's intelligence, in my opinion, or uh, mo most of them. Like, they guide the reader too much, like... <sighs> like you, like... Assuming that you are not able to follow the story if you don't explain pretty much everything there is to explain about what's going on. And that really irritates me. But yeah, this does not underestimate the reader, and I really appreciate it for that. Next one was a reread. See, a bit of clear. Haruki Murakami, Norwegian Wood, translated by Alexi Milonov. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, a reread. And I read this in very, you know, close closely after I read Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, which is actually mentioned in this book. And, you know, that sort of made me appreciate sort of uh, this novel a bit more, like to draw some, you know, comparisons between the books. I'm not going too much into that in this video. I might make comparison or influence video um, later in the future, I don't know. But anyway, um, 
Many people criticize Murakami for his portrayal of women, misogyny and all that. Which is quite sad in my opinion because then they fail to see all the good that's in the in his books, especially in this one. And this is often said to be an, uh, a love story, which it is not. I think this is a tale of survival. Uh, the book starts with this man being on a plane, reminiscing about the past, like there's a certain memory that he just can't get rid of. And then, you know, we get to follow that past throughout the novel. There is a suicide. There are, you know, there's a lot of depression, obviously. More suicides and death. <laughs> Not a very happy book. And it kind of, I think this explores know what kind of people survive and thrive in in the real world so to say like how some collapse under the burden of growing up and how some you know face it, how some face the challenges of adulthood and life in general and how they survive to tell the tale. So yeah, really amazing book in my opinion. All right, the last one is uh, not really a book, but more of an author. So I read three early works by Walter Kilpi, one of our greatest writers. I don't think he has been translated into English because it is very difficult to translate, I think. But yeah, he wrote uh, very early in his career, at the very beginning of the 20th century, uh, three short works, very, um, very lyrical prose. And yeah, the books weren't that good, in my opinion, like maybe quite mediocre. But I think I think uh, I think uh, I appreciate them more with time. But they weren't exactly great hits as I read them. But um, what really impressed me was Kilpi's writing. It's like I said, very lyrical. It's slow, very dreamlike, pondering, unlike anything else I've read in my life. And that's, you know, quite impressive. And from now on, whenever I hear or see lyrical writing mentioned, I think about Walter Kilby and his early works, and that is quite something in my opinion that, that that's that's the mark that he left on me so yeah i guess that's that's all for this time so like i said not the best not the worst just a bunch of books from 2020 that left the biggest mark on me um uh, yeah i'd like to hear if you've had any experience like that where a uh, book might not uh, be exactly the best or the worst of your reading year but it somehow impressed you or so much that you just can't get a read of it in your mind so to say so yeah what book left a big mark on you that's what i would like to know you don't have to <laughs> answer if you don't feel like so yeah, uh, hopefully 
there won't be such a gap between this and the next video. I'm, I have one uh, review video in mind, or actually two. Let's see if I get to those, and yeah, I guess that's, that's it this time. Take care, see you soon.